just so you know, you're in the re-architecting for Drupal 8 talk, and you're also right here in the galaxy. <laughs> okay, so what we'll be talking about today is we'll be looking at, uh, you know, we'll, uh, what we did is a, you know, basically a case analysis of a previous job that we had, uh, that we had worked. So um, we'll be looking at why to do something like that to familiarize yourself with Drupal 8. Um, we'll take a look at the custom LMS uh, that we built with, uh, with Drupal 7, the, the features, our content strategy, the modules used for Drupal 7, and the custom development that was required. And then we'll look into the considerations of rebuilding that site with Drupal 8. Um, any architectural differences that uh, with Drupal 8, the uh, UI changes that Drupal 8 gives us, and also uh, what the module landscape is in Drupal 8. And then we'll look at specifically what we needed to change within that custom LMS that we built uh, to make it work with Drupal 8. Uh, so a little bit about myself. My name is uh, Frank Anderson. Uh, I'm a father and a technology enthusiast uh, online. You can find me as Frob uh, on Drupal.org, IRC, or GitHub. Uh, you can follow me at, on Twitter at, at FrobDFS or read my blog at FrobiaVox.com. I work for a company called Clarity Innovations. So Clarity Innovations is a professional services firm based in Portland, Oregon. Uh, we focus on providing K through 12 and higher education uh, technology consulting to nonprofits, corporations, and, uh, and schools. Uh, we have 25 employees that provide uh, leading edge technology and design skills with, uh, and we combine that with direct experience in the classroom and university. Uh, we develop solutions for our clients using strategic consulting, professional development, and content creation and uh, engineering solutions such as apps and web apps and websites to help support those, uh, those teaching and learning pro uh, projects. And today we're going to be looking at a client project uh, so this is a real-world example of, uh, of, yeah, of a custom LMS that we built. Uh, this one is for New Perspectives Online. It's a custom LMS built around the, our client's curriculum. So first we're going to take a look at you know, why you do, uh, do something like this. Now this particular, uh, uh, this particular project that I'm, uh, that I'm doing right now, as in the talk that we're listening to, was a project that we did internally to help evaluate our, uh, you know, Drupal 8. Because every time we do an evaluation or an estimation of a new project, we have to ask ourselves, should we do this with Drupal 8 or should we do this with Drupal 7? Because, I mean, it really comes down to uh, Drupal 7 still has a lot of life left in it and it's still a very viable product. As, uh, and uh, we need to be, uh, so we need to really get more familiar with Drupal 8 in order to, uh, uh, in order to properly assert which, you know, which version we should look at. Please don't crowd by the door. Um, we need to fill in the, the aisles and the, uh, the spaces around, and there are still some seats. Um, so I want to make sure I get this out of the way right, uh, right away, which is I'm not going to be going over any hard numbers for any particular products. Like It's not going to be like two times more expensive or anything like that. Because basically, based off of what I know right now about your particular project and your question, is it depends. So, um, so one of the primary reasons why I personally wanted to take on this, uh, yeah, the session was, uh, I create things with Drupal eight. I build site or I build stuff with Drupal seven, and I want to start using Drupal eight more. Which means I need to know the key differences between the two platforms, and. Uh, I'd like to know more how I can leverage a lot of the new features with Drupal 8 so that when I am, you know, approached with a Drupal 8 project, I am less like this and more like this. So let's take a look at our uh, custom LMS architecture. And first I want to get rid of, uh, get through some of the prerequisites on, on this because it is a, uh, uh, kind of a niche product in LMS. And so what an LMS is, is a learning management system, and that's uh, software that's designed to allow for the organization uh, and delivery of course training programs. So if you've used, you know, Drupalize Me or buildamodule.com, you've actually used an LMS. You may just not have realized that. So um, a traditional LMS is based on a traditional course, uh, uh, you know, uh, course layout, and that is a collection of le uh, lesson plans, 
uh, which are a collection of units or modules, which are them themselves a collection of either lessons, projects, assessments, or mini lessons. And so to build this out, uh, we basically, we took the, the modules themselves and we made those into menus. Uh, not Drupal modules, this is a module as in a collection of, uh, you know, a collection of those lessons and mini lessons and so on. And then we built those out using uh, segments, which those are the actual node equivalents. And then inside of those nodes, we had uh, paragraph items that allowed us to, uh, to build everything up. And so the, uh, the lesson plans, uh, because there are multiples of them, we built those out using uh, just select fields on the nodes themselves. So now I want to apologize in advance for the unskippable tutorial that you're about to do, but I think that it's important that we take a look at some basic Drupal architecture just to make sure that we're all on the same page. So as I start talking about bundles and properties and entities and that sort of thing, we're, you know, we're not losing anybody. But you know, don't worry too much because we're really going to be speaking primarily on entities, fields, and variables. Uh, so, you know, don't think it's going to get uh, too basic or take too long. So basically, uh, in Drupal, uh, Drupal 7 starting with, uh, entities were, you know, our things. They're how we build things in Drupal. So um, in Drupal 6, we built custom things. Uh, typically, it was either a node or it was totally custom. But in Drupal 7, they ported the content creation kit that allowed us to attach fields to nodes uh, over, to, you know, over into core, which gave us fieldable entities. And uh, so uh, it's even gotten better with Drupal 8 because in Drupal 7, the didn't really have an API around any of that. It was just that entities are things they exist, have at them, but there was no real good entity API, uh, except for in Contrib. But in Drupal 8, we have a fully fledged entity API, uh, which is derived from the capabilities of the entity API that was in Contrib in, uh, in Drupal 7. And so starting with Drupal 7, everything from users and taxonomy terms and nodes, those are all really just types of entities. So uh, an entity can also have bundles to allow for uh, multiple collections of fields, so an entity, uh, uh, so a field instance would be unique to that bundle, and so uh, a um, a bundle would be, you know, allocated to a content type. So you can have one entity type, which is the node or the content entity, and then you can have multiple types of content, and those multiple types of content can have fields attached to them, so that you can have unique fields across different uh, different bundles, uh, but. Uh, but an entity also has properties that span across the entire bundle. So the properties would be like who created that entity, who, uh, you know, what's the status of the node? Is it published or unpublished? And yeah, those are, uh, or the great created date. Those are all properties that would be on, uh, on that. So the field instance is a place for complex data uh, in an entity bundle and a property is more for simple storage. So, uh, you know, properties are linked to the entity themselves, such as nodes, and fields are linked to the bundle or the content type, such as page. And uh, properties are stored uh, more closely to the node-specific table, which makes them much faster to access. Uh, and uh, but the fields are stored on their own tables. And then variables are basically the uh, kind of like the last bastion, the only thing that Drupal 7 really gives a, uh, you know, developers as a place to store things that isn't in a, cu a custom table itself is in variables, which is just one big monolithic table where everything's in there and there's only one access to it. And it really isn't that great of a, uh, of a system, which is why we got configuration uh, in Drupal 8, but that's getting ahead of myself. So, um, Getting back to the LMS part of it, so it, in a uh, yeah in a traditional LMS, um, the curriculum designer will design the curriculum based around something called a backwards design philosophy. Um, so that starts with a standard, and then they build everything out uh, using something that they call the five E's: the engage, explain, explore, elaborate, and evaluate. And these are all tools that the con uh, that the curriculum designers use to put all of that information into an actual curriculum. So we distill that down to, 
uh, to these three things, the teaching, application, and assessment. Uh, so that, allow, uh, that gives our LMS the ability to allow the curriculum designers to uh, uh, achieve their goals of activating, uh, activating prior knowledge, modeling or teaching, practice, application, and assessment. And so we did all that with our LMS structure with just the uh, menus, nodes, and paragraph items. And the way we accomplish that is using these core modules, uh, not Drupal core, but these modules that are core to our functionality. Uh, so I gave a talk on uh, modern Drupal 7 development at a meetup in Portland a year or two ago, and I'm not gonna go through every single like module for Drupal 7 that was really cool that we should be using to develop stuff. Uh, but I did write a blog post on it, and if you want to read it, it's probably out of date because it's you know, a year or two old, but the link will be in the uh, uh, slides, uh, slide notes that get posted at the end. Um, but I will go over the modules that we used in this project uh, that are core to the functionality, and then later I'll talk about how they relate uh, in terms of building with Drupal 8. Um, and remember when building a site in general, uh, since this is the site building track, um, that the output uh, when picking a module, the, uh, the output that Drupal gives us is always a suggestion. You know, you do the content creators a, a favor and put their needs above what actually gets output you know, for the design, and then leave that to the themers and the developers to figure out how to take that content that can be input and managed properly and get displayed uh, the way that the design requires. So the first module that's really core to our functionality uh, is the paragraphs module. Uh, if you are familiar with the field collection module, paragraphs module is kind of absurd that um, with uh, one major key feature that uh, the, fe uh, the field collection module didn't give you, and that is the ability to pick what bundle the uh, of entity that you're linking to at the time of content creation. So you can't, uh, when you're creating your node, uh, your node type, you're not saying like, oh, this field will always be this collection of fields. It instead is, this is a paragraph item, and then when the content creators are coming in, they can say, oh, this is going to be a block of text, or this is going to have an image that's over here, and so you can then put an image field in and a long text field, and then when it gets displayed, it can be pro uh, put in properly. Um, marketing heavy people love this type of thing because they can pick out very highly structured uh, you know, theming that you can then build into this as full out templates uh, that's then never break because you can't break the HTML because all you're doing is entering raw text and putting uh, images into fields. So it works really well for that. And then there's the Entity Form module. Uh, in Drupal 8, this module was renamed to eForm um, because Entity Forms are an actual like reserved thing in Drupal 8. Uh, but the cool part about this module allows us to use the field API to create web forms. So uh, unlike the web form module where the form itself is also considered content, uh, you would create the forms uh, and then you would give them, uh, give the, create, uh, the uh, people who are uh, doing the content creation the ability to you know, choose between pre-built you know, pre forms. And the really awesome part about this is that the form submissions themselves are entities. So they go through the entire entity workflow and they can be displayed in views with, uh, you know, with different display modes and uh, all kinds of things that you, know, you can do uh, that you can't do with uh, web form, you can do with uh, entity form right out of the box. Another module that we used is uh, the entity view attachment module, which allows you to create views and attach them as pseudo fields so that you can display those views on the entity itself. Um, this is a really handy for things like taxonomy terms and, uh, and also related content. Uh, anytime that you can use the arguments of whatever it is to filter out the results of a view uh, to make the results dynamic, uh, this becomes a very, very powerful tool uh, you know, on those types of things. And then uh, one of the last uh, modules that we used as uh, part of the core functionality of the LMS is the flag module. Now the flag module allows users to flag entities. Um, you're you know, most likely familiar with the flag as inappropriate or uh, and if, you, if you're on drupal.org, you'll see the, sub, uh, the like subscribe so that your user can subscribe to follow uh, particular issues and that sort of thing. Uh, that's done with, like, the uh, with the flag module. Um, these last two modules that I'm going to put out 
we didn't use much per se is uh, as far as like core functionality, but I just have to point at, uh, point at them because they're just awesome modules. Um, the first one is coffee. So uh, for site builders, these, uh, yeah, these two modules are really pertinent. Coffee allows you to uh, quickly just go from one place to another by uh, much like the spotlight on your Mac or the start button on your Windows machine. You can just put in a key command, start typing out, and it'll find that admin route and it'll go there without having to go through a bunch of drop downs in like an admin menu or you clicking through a bunch of things or you just being so involved with the Drupal project that you instinctively know every route in your, uh, in your head and you just type in the URL. Um, and the next module is the speed boxes module. Um, this allows us to check multiple check boxes at the same time, which is super useful for the uh, permissions page. So let's watch the GIF here. Ta-da! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> yeah, that, that's worth it right there, right? Uh, so. One thing that I haven't uh, spoken about it at all with, uh, within terms to this is, uh, is blocks. So just a quick word on blocks. The, uh, this isn't a block heavy site because there's not a whole lot of reusable content. The LMS itself is, uh, yeah, the, the course is the content. And so it works more like a web app in that, uh, in that sense. And um, because of that, there aren't really any blocks that aren't just displaying navigation. Um, but when I do use blocks, the, the Bean module is, uh, is kind of the go-to for that. So Bean stands for Block Entities Aren't Nodes, which is a slight jab at the Node Blocks module that gives you similar functionalities, but just, again, like in Drupal, set, or like Drupal 6 days, just turns all your blocks into nodes. Um, but what this does is it allows you to attach fields directly to different node, or different block types. So you can say this is a block type that, is, you know, that displays this type of content and then you can put in fields that are pertinent specifically for that type of block and then you can have multiple types that it, when content creators are going through and they're saying, yeah, I want to create a new block, you know, you, uh, I normally remove almost everything that has to do with the sort of default Drupal block management uh, system and uh, then mirror the, uh, the content creation system, so like admin content blocks in this case, and then add new block, and then have that add new block go to a, you know, select what block type you want, uh, mirroring the sort of content creation uh, workflow. And it's just really awesome. So, I don't always use blocks, but when I do, I use the bean module. Uh, so, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the content strategy around our, uh, our LMS. Um, so in the end, we had 13 different paragraph item types that uh, are bundles that went all with, along with one content type. Um, three of these were interactive. We had a text response, a checkbox list, and a drag and drop. Now, all of these required users to submit their data and that for, uh, for that data to be stored. That data was always stored in entity forms that correlated. Uh, so in the text response, we have the, uh, the ability for people to just input their stuff. It's a very simple one. Uh, then checkbox list. Uh, they, all of the uh, stuff that tr they fill out there for the question and those options, those are all done in the paragraph item. That's not done in an entity form. So we've got pre-built entity forms that are there just for storing the data, but when the form is, uh, is presented, it, uh, it has the information from the paragraph item. And then lastly, the drag and drop. Um, so these all allow them to do that, uh, uh, to do that application and evaluation uh, portion of the uh, LMS strategy, and then all of these, uh, uh, all of these can be combined to form larger whole uh, components. So um, we had some that were used for like inter and intra uh, module navigation. So um, the person can like, oh, I need, I want to learn more about this. Um, they don't want you to sit in front of the door. Um, there's still some seats available. Um, and in the back too, they don't want you guys standing in front of the doors because it's a fire hazard. Um, so the, uh, 
you know, we had some that were more, more for insurance navigation, some that were for support, and then the rest were mainly for, you know, the actual instruction of the videos, the images, and the text. Um, but every time uh, one of those form submissions goes through, it has to link back to the uh, paragraph item that, w uh, that presented the form. So linking the entity form submission to the paragraph item, uh, each interactive paragraph item had a corresponding entity form um, that had an entity reference back to the paragraphs item that displayed the form. And we used the paragraphs item bundle machine name to pick which, for, uh, which uh, entity form to display, and that was all done in code. Um, put it all together uh, using Drupal's you know, ingenious render array system that really just doesn't care what it's rendering. It's just, if it's in a proper render array structure and it's themable, we can just Hulk smash all of these entity forms into paragraph items and just display it all uh, and save any user's response and have it linked so that we know what user was responding to the entity form and we know what a paragraph item was displaying that entity form at the time so that we could, dis uh, so that we could save all the correlating data and we know who was doing what at what time. And then we also had to provide for self-evaluation uh, within the LMS. So um, our client wanted us to be able to have people share their responses and then learn from the responses of others to do that self-evaluation. And so we used the flags module to let users share their responses. So after somebody saved, then the share button that you see right now labeled as unshare becomes active. Once that becomes active, those three responses on the bottom uh, become populated. And uh, then people can unshare their responses if they no longer want, to, you know, if they're embarrassed with what they shared after reading other people's stuff, they can, oh, I want to retract that. Don't show that. And then uh, we could also, uh, you yeah, they could also go through, edit their response, and save again. So, uh, when we were building all this out, our initial expectation was that all of this content would be entered into a spreadsheet, and then at one point I was writing a migration that migrated all of that content from the spreadsheet into the, cont uh, into the LMS um, so that we could have both projects kind of running uh, simultaneously. Once we chose the paragraph items, uh, or the paragraph uh, you know, module, and we had all of that stuff built out, um, yeah, they, uh, our clients and our content creators saw it and they're like, yeah, this is easier than trying to input the stuff into Excel. So we're just going to start using the site, which saved a lot of development time because I no longer had to write a big long migration that took a bunch of stuff out of uh, CSV and then put it all into like interrelated content, edit, uh, you know, paragraph items. So that kind of brings us into the custom developments. Um, now, the, ma uh, the majority of our functionality was all put into the, um, an implementation of hook entity view alter for the paragraph items, and then hook form alter to edit the form to have, uh, to put all the corresponding fields in, uh, in there. So in our, um, in our hook entity, uh, entity view alter, uh, what we did is we used the machine names to correlate the, uh, the paragraph item with the rights uh, uh, with the correct uh, entity form. And so uh, we used a call user func uh, call, which is basically the same way that hooks work in Drupal. So all we had to do then is implement uh, that custom function to, uh, to then bring, uh, you know, basically combine those. And this is what, that's, uh, what that implementation looks like here. So um, we basically just get the, uh, get the entity we have to load the entity form uh, stuff up here. So uh, all of the, uh, we have to include all of the uh, entity form module includes. Uh, then we have to set the entity form name and then we get the, uh, get the type of entity and we pass it all. We have to, uh, we had to wrap it over into our own implementation of get entity form here. Uh, which is basically means that we had to copy some of the code from the entity form module into our own module and modify a couple key bits just to make sure that all uh, make all this stuff happens. Um, we set some attributes on the form and we did other stuff and then we just render the uh, render the form out and throw it into the render array as a uh, as a rendered form. Um, so that's uh, in the film and the form alter. That's when we actually change the form itself to. Uh, change the labels of the form 
uh, of like the different form items to display, you know, what the paragraph item told it to display. Um, but that's also where it gets, uh, where did my cursor go? That's also where it gets much more complicated, um, mainly because Ajax. Um, so all of these forms had to, uh, had to display, they had to submit, and then they had to be shared all through Ajax. So that means that we had to have the, um, we had to have the, um, we had to have the, uh, the actual uh, flag not, uh, not display, so it's not flaggable until after the save event happens, because then they would be flagging that they've shared, that's something that they've never input. And then we also needed to be able to only share those things, uh, you know, the shared responses, after they flagged it. So all of these had to hook into the flagging events so that we can do it. And I'm not gonna go into the specific code of doing the Ajax stuff because that's just really well documented in a lot of other places. And I don't know, that'd be boring, I think. So, so we, had, uh, we have some considerations to, you know, in building a, uh, a new LMS with Drupal 8. Uh, so those considerations are any architectural differences that Drupal 8 has, the UI changes that Drupal 8 has, uh, it's the module availability, and then we need to look at specifically what do we need to adapt in our code to port from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. And those would be the, uh, yeah, any custom developments or content strategy or anything along those lines. But there's also some general considerations. And these are more things that, as I was working with Drupal 8, knowing Drupal 7 pretty intimately, um, these are things that I kind of stub my toe on, and so sharing that knowledge with you. Um, one thing to remember is to set up the Devel module. Um, Kumo isn't really there anymore, so that whole nice Devel ability to like DPM things and click through and see the, ni the nice hierarchy of stuff. Kumo doesn't work with, uh, with real objects and thus it's not going to really work because now Drupal uses all you know, real objects. Um, there's also no module disable. So the, uh, okay, so there it is. Okay, good, found my cursor. Um, there's also no module disable. So it's really, you uninstall the module or you die. That's the only two options there if you're trying to remove a module. Uh, and uh, because Drupal 7's configuration management su uh, system makes the database of configuration um, more of an ephemeral thing, it's not supposed to be, that's not the permanent storage, the s permanent storage is supposed to be in the file system. Um, if you disable a module, all of, the end, uh, all of the configuration related to that module has to be deleted or else bad things happen to the site, so they've removed the ability to disable modules, um, which means that yeah, you turn it off and your configuration's erased, and if you didn't back up that configuration by exporting it uh, in the configuration management system, then you're, yeah, you're hosed. So um, the other kind of things to remember is um, there's no more cache clearing, it's now your cache rebuilding. The entire cache system in Drupal 8 has been rebuilt. Uh, and it's much, much more robo uh, robust to the point of you can, you know, like there's certain experimental modules out there that allow you to click on things that only load the part of the page that would change on that page load. That's how robust the, uh, the, the caching system is uh, with Drupal 8. Um, but the problem with that comes down to the caches are very, very aggressive and so your, any little change could require a cache rebuild, which means that you probably want to enable developer mode, um, which has a really nice long uh, tutorial that kind of works on Drupal.org. Um, you know, there'll be a link in the, in the thing there, but uh, there's also a, uh, you could use Drupal console to enable that, and it, it, uh, it does, drop down the aggressiveness of the caches, but there's really not a good way to disable the caches completely in Drupal 8. Um, none that I've found um, anyway. And, um, but the nice thing about you know, doing work with Drupal 8 is that there's lots and lots of stuff out there. Uh, there's lots of people who are working on all these problems for Drupal 8, but there's also a problem with all of the documentation that we find for Drupal 8, and that is that a lot of it is, you know, really out of date because a lot of this documentation was written well before Drupal 8 was anywhere near release. And this includes the documentation that you'll find on Drupal.org. 
Uh, so one such thing is we were working on a Drupal 8 project that required the poll module. And everything that we read on Drupal.org said, yeah, the poll module's in core. It's like, no, the poll module was, requ uh, was removed like two years ago from core. But nobody ever updated any of those pages on Drupal.org of like, what's still in core, what's not in core. So, you know, we had to put it in issue, get that changed, and, you know, and fix the documentation on Drupal.org when we found that. But, it, you know, nobody was really paying attention. So, there was that as well. Okay, let's see here. There we go. So we, now we're getting into the architectural differences with uh, within Drupal, uh, Drupal 8. And I'm not going to give you an exhaustive list of all the new Drupal 8 features because that would just take way too long and be really boring. Uh, but I'm going to give you uh, sort of a list of key things. Uh, and in the end, you're really going to have a list of things to Google and you know, kind of research on your own time with Drupal 8. And uh, so the first thing I'm going to dive into with a, you know, with a little bit of detail, I'm not going to go into super detail, is configuration entities. Um, I'm not going to go into super detail other than to say that the configuration management initiative is probably one of the largest changes uh, and positive changes to uh, developing uh, and deploying stuff with Drupal. Um, and it's all for the better, of course. So the, one of the great things about it, though, in my opinion, is that if you really have your heart set on the Drupal 7 like database syncing modules and you just want to completely ignore the configuration management initiative, you actually can. You can nothing's going to stop you from keeping your databases all in sync and developing like you're still developing on Drupal 6. The, uh, the main thing uh, that you need to know, though, is configuration entities allow the developers to actually create structure for their data. That structure is all supported within Drupal, and so you can really take a lot of advantage of, uh, along this as well. And there's even, you know, there, there's issues out there to try to make like configuration entities much more along the same lines of content entities, bringing them back into views, bringing them, uh, bringing them back into uh, like the REST API and that sort of thing, and making it so that they're more exposed, uh, which is all good stuff. But I'm not really going to go into too much more detail, uh, basically because there's, you know, I could do, you know, one or two talks just on configuration entities. They wouldn't be good talks. They'd be really, really boring. But I could do it. There's that much content out there. Um, does anybody, uh, anybody unfamiliar with semantic versioning? Every, you don't know what semantic, okay. so. Semantic versioning is the other really big cool feature with Drupal 8, and it allows you to have your, uh, you've, you've seen like, oh, 8.3 just came out, now everybody's working on 8.4. Well, that .4, uh, there's really three numbers there. And so you've got 8.4.x is the new Drupal like 8 development branch. That's where all the new cool features are being developed and all the new bugs are, are going in. And then 8.3 is just in bug fixing mode. So the, uh, the idea being that when you have that, you know, like first dot second dot third number, that third number is really just there to say that, yeah, bugs have been fixed. Everything's still backwards compatible. Everything should still work, but bugs are being fixed. That second number, uh, that first dot second dot third, the second number in there in the middle, that means new features are being added. It's not just a bunch of bug fixes. These aren't just security fixes or you know, things that we found that were wrong. We're adding new features to Drupal. That means Drupal 8 will get more robust as time goes on. And then that first uh, digit, the big eight there, that, you know, so first dot second dot third, the first digit, the eight, that means backwards compatibility is gone. We changed that number and the stuff, uh, you can no longer count on everything that worked on Drupal 8 to be working with Drupal 9. So as those numbers increment, you know, the, uh, we'll be able to fix bugs with the last number, we'll be able to add new features with that middle number and still keep it backwards compatible, and then we can break backwards compatibility with that first number. So everything is very transparent. And um, a lot of that just works, because, uh, works really well because the Drupal associations put a lot of time and effort into proper unit testing and making sure that everything is as you know, backwards compatible as it's going to be because everything is very tested. So now you know about semantic versioning. Um, so blocks now function much more like nodes as well. So um, they, uh, so they're full-fledged full -fledged entities. All of that stuff that I told you about the bean module, that all works in Drupal 8 out of the box with no contrib. Uh, so you can have different types of blocks 
and those different types of blocks can have different fields attached to them, and those, uh, uh, and so you can have all kinds of really cool stuff that you can build out there. Um, but they still have a big Achilles heel, and that is the content is a content entity, that's the block. The placement is a configuration entity, and so the configuration is exportable, the content is not. Uh, so you can really work yourself into some issues if you're trying to export that configuration for a block that's not going to exist in production. So you export all that block configuration, all that new stuff, and then you import it into production, but none of those blocks exist yet, so all you have now are a bunch of dependency errors and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, so there's, uh, there's various workflows that you can use to get around this. Uh, there's a really good blog post that just uh, that came out a, few, uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, on a website called valuebound.com, uh, but uh, that kind of explore different scenarios for this. Uh, but again, that link will be in the slides. Uh, so uh, now we've got display modes. So uh, we've got we had content display or content view modes in Drupal 7, uh, but there was no UI built around it. Um, so if you're familiar, uh, if you ever used Display Suite or you used uh, the entity view mode module. Uh, those two modules really gave you a uh, the ability to display content in different ways. So you could have a view mode that's uh, that only, you know for the user that's just the user picture, their name, maybe a blurb about their description, and then that could be on like a user listing page. But if you went to the full view of the view, you uh, you would have a different view of the pay, uh, of the uh, of that user and the configuration for that is stored with the user entity. So uh, so now we have view modes and we within Drupal 8, we have a full-fledged UI to create new view modes for any of your entities and do all of, uh, do all of these things. It's a really robust uh, system. So now if you, uh, without installing any other modules, you can go into the Drupal I UI, you can edit the view modes, you can add a, a teaser view mode, you can add a grid view mode or some other listing view mode or all these different things to create all of these uh, you know, different ways of displaying your content uh, in Drupal 8. Now, the, this is the, the bigger one with the view modes that Drupal 8 gives us and that's form view modes. So all of that stuff I, I was just talking about with content being able to display content in different ways, now you can do that with forms in Drupal 8. So that means your user registration form that has the thousand things that your client wants to know about your user, but none of it's required, you can now have two of those, uh, two user input forms. One that's a very simple, give me your, you know, what do you want for your username, what's your email address, what's your password. Okay, now that you've input all that stuff and we have all of, all of that and you have a user, here's your user edit page that has a thousand things on it. So now you can edit that and input those things. So you can create multiple, view, uh, multiple forms for, uh, for individual entities and bundles and things. Um, and it has a full-fledged UI in Drupal 8 and that's all just really cool. Now there's also uh, new field types that are in core. Uh, one that we make a lot of use of, and it's in use very heavily in core as well, which is great, is the, the entity reference field. Uh, so that's no longer a contrib one. There's also the link field and the telephone number field. Um, and this is your list of things to Google. Um, so, um, so now we have composer support, and you know, most of these things to Google are actually backboarded to Drupal 7 as well, uh, but so the, uh, except for the experimental modules. But uh, anyways, the, the, th uh, the composer support is really cool. It's going to change your entire workflow. If you're still using Drush DL, you need to stop and start using composer and you need to, uh, you need to watch, uh, Jesus did a really good presentation yesterday on the uh, on a, uh, workflows, new workflows for Drupal, uh, it, talking about the composer uh, and how you use composer with Drupal and yeah, definitely go watch that. That's the, uh, the most detail I'll go into any of these though. Um, so there's the toolbar update, uh, which gives you a, a responsive nav bar. Uh, that's also been ported to Drupal 7 as the nav bar module. There's the responsive image styles. So you can have different image styles that work responsively. So different, depending on the breakpoints, different, uh, yeah, you have source sets and all that fun stuff in your, uh, in, as for your image styles. That's been backported as the picture module in Drupal 8. Um, file entities are now in core. There's a RESTful API in core, um, which you can handle any number of ways with Drupal 7. 
And then there's a whole slew of experimental core modules. Now, experimental core modules are more like functionality that you're not gonna be able to hang your hat on because if there isn't a lot of support for it in core, it's gonna go away. But uh, these are some of the things that I think are not gonna be going away because these are kind of things that are, uh, uh, that are in there right now in the latest version of Drupal 8.3. Um, and that's content moderation, uh, content workflows, uh, field layouts, and uh, the migrate uh, stuff. So uh, there's now a migrate Drupal user interface. So if you were familiar in Drupal 7 with the Drupal to Drupal migrate module, uh, that's coming into core to help with migrating sites from like old versions of Drupal and bringing them up to date with new versions of Drupal. And then there's also a bunch of stuff from like the outside in uh, initiative. So those are all your things to Google. I hope you took notes. So the, uh, we're gonna talk about the UI changes and it's good news because the, you know, there's not a whole lot of UI changes in Drupal uh, 8. Um, if you're new to Drupal, that could be bad news too because you know, Drupal 8 has, uh, has kind of a reputation for it, but these are some of the, uh, the more notable things that have changed in the UI. So uh, there's an operations dropdown so you're no longer just gonna be able to hit the delete button really quickly on things because you're gonna have to click through stuff. And I don't know how they pick what the default is supposed to be for those. So if anybody out in here does know how the default operation is picked, come see me afterwards, because I'd love to know. Um, like I was saying before with the, uh, the form display settings, so uh, this is something that I struggled with for longer because, uh, than I wanted to just because I was so overconfident in my uh, knowledge of Drupal. Um, but the form, uh, the, there's a new tab for manage form display. So the actual form widgets and field widgets and things are no longer in the field settings tab. Um, so on manage fields, you're just saying, like, yeah, use this field. This field is on, uh, is on there. It's not a drag and drop. You're not reordering things. It's not for figuring out how the form is supposed to look. That's on the manage form display section. So I, you know, I spent like two hours dealing with that when I was doing this, longer than I'd care to admit, but I'm admitting it for your benefit. So yeah, this is good news for the learning curve of, uh, of Drupal because uh, if you already know Drupal 7, that's not gonna be you. You're already past that. You're up at the top where the bulldozer is. <laughs> so. so. Uh, now we need to acknowledge the elephant in the room with Drupal 8. So, so the big problem is really the, uh, yeah, the module availability issue. Uh, with Drupal 8, the entity form module is not supported. It has no plans for being supported. Um, and so there, there's discussion as to whether or not the module is even necessary. Um, I, of course, do believe it's necessary because I'm, yeah, I'm, I love that module, it's a great module, and there's nothing really in core or elsewhere in contrib that does the things that I want, uh, that, that I use the uh, entity form module for. Um, but the, uh, the module worked well enough to complete this experiment, um, but not really in, well enough to use it on an actual client project. So uh, there were some bugs of like, adding fields to things and then deleting those fields and coming back and the fields are still there and stuff like that. Just like general, you know, weird bugs that were going on. Uh, so I would never use it currently in a, you know, in a production website as it sits, which means we have to find an alternative. Uh, so, you know, custom entities are always an option. Yeah, you know, that would require custom code using, you know, Drupal console to, you know, yeah, scaffold me out a new entity type and put, you know, make it have these bundles and these types of fields on it, which, you know, wouldn't be difficult, but I mean, if I'm building a site, I wanna use the user interface. So let's, let's look at other things. Um, it gives us the comment module. Comments are also full-fledged entities in Drupal 8. And comments can be put in Drupal 8 on different types of entities than just nodes. So this is a pretty viable solution. It would require a lot more custom code and also you know, kind of thinking about it, these things aren't content. Yeah, you know, these uh, these responses are not comments. Uh, they're you know, they're responses to questions. So it doesn't really match the uh, you know the the idea. And then there's the 
Uh, there's a bunch of like contact module extras, so storing the, uh, the stuff from the contact module, uh, because the contact uh, forms in Drupal 8 are fieldable. So you can go and you can create multiple bundles of contact forms and then have those contact forms have fields on them that are all unique and you can really do all of the things that you did with entity form with the contact form except for one big thing and that is out of the box it doesn't store any of that information. It just presents the form. And also, again, it's a module in core that's designed around being for contacts. You know, putting a, you know, a send an email to this person form on your, uh, on your module, which means you're not using a module as it's designed, which means that whatever you do to make it work is going to be kind of hacky and could possibly break in the future. So another, uh, another really good contender though, uh, probably the best contender is the relation module. Um, this isn't a module I brought up from, uh, from there, but it's a Drupal 7 and it has a Drupal 8 version. Um, but, uh, uh, it's a really, really cool module, and it gives us the ability to uh, sort of mirror or supplant the, uh, some of the functionality that you would find in like the flag module, organic groups, in the sense that it allows you to sort of bind entities together. Um, not in the way that a entity relation does, where you're just like, okay, this module's pointing at that one, but more of a, this module has a relation uh, relationship with these other entities. So it brings this, this concept of entity endpoints, um, which allows fieldable relations between entities. And uh, I've used this uh, module uh, in, make, in like saving user states for like web apps where the, uh, yeah, the configuration of the app is, uh, is like a node and then somebody goes on and they're saving that, uh, you know, they, they're interacting with it and they're saving their user uh, state. So that's, uh, that would be a good use of like the relation module or uh, keeping track of somebody's user, uh, you know, their progression in a professional development portal. Um, those are all good uses of the uh, relation module. And yeah, I would use it in this case, but the, uh, the issue is that it's really not any more stable than the E4 module at this point. So there's that. The only difference really being that it, uh, the people who are behind the relationship module are also saying that they're going to support Drupal 8, whereas the E4 module, they're questioning as to whether or not they need to. So uh, sort of the last alternative is the one that I would really like to push people toward, and that is the funding the development of a stable release of the module. Um, you know, so I do encourage finding alternatives, but at this state in Drupal 8, um, we really need to encourage everybody to choose that final option of telling our clients like, in order to build this with the newest version of Drupal that's gonna have the longest term support, we need to up the uh, budget a bit and, and fund the actual development of this module that's going to bring in this functionality that we require. Um, that's what already happened with Drupal 7. That's why the Drupal 7 contrib space is as robust as it is. It's because it's been out for so long, everybody who's needed functionality has already paid to have that functionality built. And we really need to do that uh, with Drupal 8 now. So the big, uh, second big problem was more a problem with me, and uh, this is what I was talking about before with the, uh, the field widget selection, or field widget selection, and that's the paragraphs doesn't want me to reference paragraph items. Um, it is possible, there's nothing stopping me from doing it, but uh, as soon as I saw that I didn't have that field widget, I immediately thought that the paragraphs module was hiding something from me, so I started diving into that code and trying to figure out, like, what is it doing to keep this away from me? And then I realized that there was a field widget, you know, the field widgets were on a different page, and I was just, you know, jumping the gun there. Uh, so it is marked an experimental widget because they don't want you to use it because they, uh, paragraphs are not meant to be reusable content. That's more of, like, what blocks should be used for. Um, but again, they're not stopping you. It turned out to be a non-problem. Um, it was, not you know, it was me, my own f unfamiliarity and my own overconfidence that drove that problem. Um, so, you know, we do have a, you know, an elephant in the room, but if we act now, it's going to just remain a, a baby elephant. So, yeah, so. So let's look at specifically, you know, what needs to change. And so the, uh, the great thing is, is not much, because the site works more like an app than a traditional site. Um, 
that means that our expectations on choosing a framework are slightly different. Initially, Drupal was chosen because of its scalability, its user-centric permission-based mod uh, content model, its high-quality contrib space, uh, and my own familiarity with the project. I've been doing Drupal for you know, close to 10 years, and so I'm very familiar with the project, the community, and the workflow. Uh, I am always looking at other things because I am you know, a technology enthusiast, so this wasn't a choice made from the Drupal island as much as you know, Drupal is really, uh, if you have something that requires multiple users, Drupal is most likely the right, uh, the right choice for the job. And Drupal 8 has a lot of uh, new features. Uh, but the biggest advances are in underlying architecture. Um, so the, uh, like with the content and config entity system, view modes, all that fun stuff, and, and the development workflow with the switch to uh, semantic versioning. So um, there's not really a whole lot that site builders need to worry about as far as all that's concerned. So um, architecturally, our site remains the same. It has the same features, the same modules, uh, the same architecture, and the same, uh, same content strategy. And so the biggest changes were really in the, uh, in the custom development. So um, in our custom development, this is where you know, a lot of the biggest changes were made, but probably not where a lot of you are expecting necessarily. So in Drupal 7, we accomplished the Hulk smash with the uh, implementation of the hook entity view alter and the implementation of the hook, uh, hook form alter. And, uh, Drupal 8 has a new uh, object-oriented architecture, and we were able to accomplish all of this in the exact same way. So, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I know you're thinking like, you know, Drupal 8 is object-oriented programming now, we're not supposed to use the dot module file, the dot module file is supposed to be just for decoration, no, never put code there. But I mean, the, the joy of modifying aspects uh, of a program, you know, those are, uh, you know, hooks are good things. Uh, they're not gone in Drupal 8, so you know, uh, Drupal likes to change a lot of things, but they're not going to remove, uh, hopefully, the, uh, probably the best, um, you know, the best lowest bar uh, means of making an application uh, just because they stepped into OOP. Uh, so really lots changed uh, because of the uh, object-oriented architecture. It's a little bit misleading, but... Uh, it's all for the better. So when building this stuff in Drupal 7, Drupal 7 does not have a fully fledged entity API. Drupal 8 does. And so uh, we still use entity field queries to figure out like, oh, do we have this saved data already or not? Um, but uh, so we get the entity form submission that way. Uh, but the entity form submission object um, is, yeah, is something that we can actually use. So. In order to build the, uh, the new entity, uh, this could be a node or an eForm submission or a comment or anything, we can just use the entity type manager class and call the create method to create a new one, so no longer create standard object or any of that stuff. And then we can just use the, uh, you know, uh, the entity form builder service to build out the form for that existing entity. All of the fields will be in there. So the bottom there, form equals uh, service entity dot form builder, get form, that gets you the form for any entity object that you have. So no longer trying to, you know, having to rebuild half of entity form uh, in our own module to re-implement that stuff. Uh, it all just works. So um, Drupal 8 has a very intelligent use of object-oriented programming that makes site building a lot easier. Uh, what was a, over 100 lines of code is now reduced, uh, reduced to around 10 lines of code to accomplish the exact same thing. So we just, uh, we just took a look at why to look at Drupal 8. We, you know, we went through the custom LMS architecture that we used, uh, the considerations with building with Drupal 8, um, the, you know, the, the architectural differences, the user interface differences in Drupal 8, uh, the module availability, which was the big problem with Drupal 8, and then specifically what we needed to change, which was really just utilizing Drupal's APIs, um, which now exist in core. Uh, so now, Achievement unlocked. You have sat through my DrupalCon session. <laughs> so. Uh, so I want to make sure that I point out here there are sprints. Uh, this says that the 24-hour sprint lounge closes on, uh, closes on April 24th. Uh, or sorry, April 27th at midnight. So I don't know if that was last night at midnight or tonight at midnight. But uh, it, 
you know, ask somebody. There's also uh, co uh, the sprinting going on tomorrow, mentor sprinting, so take a look at that. And uh, don't forget to uh, give me feedback. This is node uh, 17242. Uh, so let me know how I did, help me to get better, or just tell me never do this again. <laughs> so thank you very much.